Hi guys, today we're going to react to Money Game Part 3 by Ren. This is a buy me a copy request from Robert M. Thank you, Robert. Much appreciated. Yep. Thank you, Robert. We appreciate the support yet again. you a story about a boy named Jimmy. One years old and his first words were mine, mine, gimme. Two years old he was walking, three years old walking quickly. Four years old he was running round the pavements of his city. Five years old and his daddy told him, listen here son, you gotta learn to be a man. A man he works for what he wants. Six years old and he's reading writing, top of the bunch. And when he's seven, his progression made him student number one. Eight years old and he's praised for unusual grades. Nine, his parents paid for private school to nurture the flame. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, he ascends and ascends. His daddy tells him, son, money is the means to all ends. Fourteen, solving complex mathematical equations at fifteen. IQ 150, still elevated. 16, he develops complex software code that detects weaknesses in cybersecurity protocols. 17, and he sells his vision, keeping the share. Not yet an adult, but he's practically a millionaire. 18, and his daddy tells him, now you're a man. This world don't give a damn about you, so take all that you can. When the music video started, it gave a slower rhythm in comparison to the other two that we've scene that slow rhythm made me think about at this stage of the story that ren is telling we are looking at a man who is set in his ways whose mind is so poisoned with materialistic ideas or whatever's wrong with the world his mind has marinated in those ideas for so long he's content to be that man who either pulls the string or falls in line with those who pull the string. He took on the role of the child's father. I could see that the motif with the bag on the head and the rope, not to say that the people are enslaved, but that their minds are enslaved. He's immediately addressing the core of the problem in which he's talking about in the past two songs, that it starts at home with the indoctrination that children get from their parents because their parents themselves are indoctrinated to think in that way. And as he unveils what he's showing us here, he's showing us that the upbringing of Jimmy is relentless. He doesn't have even a moment 
to ponder on what he's being told, to ask questions about the world. He's just being given facts and being told how to behave. He's like a robot. And I love the way he presents it. You need to see the other two in order to understand where it all starts. It starts on the family unit. I mean, the first people you learn things from is your father and your mother. The start of it, where we see the characters with the cover over the head, sort of ties it back to the first one. But as soon as it starts unfolding, you realize that this could serve as some kind of a prequel in a way to the first because the first was about the collective us and this is about a specific person and their story the way even the story starts you know let me tell you a story about a boy named jimmy it's a cautionary tale as soon as it started i actually have a bit of a hunch but i'll have to wait to the end to see it through but when he took the cover off his head and you could see in the mirror that it's ran it sort of tied you back and i think he was giving us that answer to something that we actually said in the first one where we said whether it is the higher power or the citizen who's being, you know, kind of abused, it doesn't matter. We're all kind of the same person. We're all the same. So, and Ren was pointing the finger at himself as well, saying, I am also part of the problem. I'm part of the we. So it was a collective we. And here, I think he gave us that answer. He took the hood off and it was him. And he was also the one who was, let's call it the torturer in that first one, you know, at the end sort of lighting or not lighting, you know, the lighter to kind of burn it all down. So there's different aspects that kind of give me ideas, but I'm not sure yet where this is going to go at the end, as far as the visual representation. But the way it's going so far, it's a cautionary tale. This is a kid that you know, it's been indoctrinated and just really pushed into him so far that, you know, his first words were mine, mine, gimme. So already about taking, about possession, about, you know, I want this, I want that. At first, when he says he was five years old, his daddy told him, listen here, son, you got to learn to be a man, a man he works for what he wants. So it was actually giving him good values in this one. Mm -hmm. And then later, it's money is the means to all ends, which is like teaching him about life. But then when he was 18, his daddy tells him, now you're a man, it's time you know, kind of thing, you know, it's time you know how the world works. This world don't give a damn about you, so take all that you can. And this is what shaped him. That line, you know, kind of explains why the world works the way it works in Money Game Part 2, where he actually explains to you the nitty gritty of what's happening and, and why it's all so messed up. So I think he went from, you know, the collective we, what the problem kind of is or might be with us. And then he went on to kind of educate and give us the details. And in this one, he goes back to personal. This is a story about what happened to a guy who grew into these facts that he gave us in that education and why so many people or so many other people are also like this, which creates the problem that, you know, that he presented us with in Money Game Part 1. That's what it feels like to me. Um, but I, again, I don't know where he's going to take this at the end of this part. So. Yeah, we'll see. A um, few things. When it starts, you see it as something aesthetic. The hands on the piano, and then the world goes upside down. So a distorted concept or a distorted idea, which you're about to witness. And then he goes in front of the mirror and he takes his hood off. So that, to me, it was the moment where the enslaved mind decided to join the enslaver, those who pull the strings. So he has his eyes open and he knows what's what, but he's addicted to that notion of power and is willing to play along with the way the world works. So that's what he's teaching his offspring. So basically, in this one, we see the motif, if you can't beat him, join him. So the father in this story prepares his son to be ready for a relentless world. As you said, it's not necessarily a, a bad lesson if that's the way the world works, but it shows how it perpetuates the focus on materialism and power and really overlooking what it all means. Because what he taught him, as you said, when he was 18, the world doesn't care about you. So every Everything he does past that age to, to get more powerful, it's coming from a place of fear. Nobody cares about you and you'll end up with nothing if you don't take care of yourself. Not from a place of gratitude or appreciation. It's just about ensuring that his son would be able to take care of himself in a time where he's no longer around, where, where the father is no longer around. I think that's what all parents want for their children. The intention is good, but the outcome is terrible. And also when he says, Jimmy, from the moment he could speak, he said, mine, mine, Jimmy. It kind of makes me question, is Jimmy's hunger to possess things, is that human nature? Was he born with that? Or he's like that because that's what he hears at home. Is that taught or is that inherently in all of us, the hunger for power? I don't know if he's actually answering it, here, but it's a question that popped into mind. The nature or nurture issue 
it's not quite answered here, it's hinted at, but you have to take into consideration that even the lessons the father tells or gives his son, depending on the personality of the kid, it could be taken and used completely differently, understood yeah. differently, you know, interpreted or whatever else. When he was one year old, you know, he was already saying, mine, mine, gimme. So at that stage, it could be that he's, you know, like a sponge and, and that's what he took from his surrounding. And it could be that that was his personality that, that he was born with. Could be either or or both. But the father, when he gives him these lessons, you know, the first one, as I said, was actually a good lesson. It was like an honorable one telling him that you got to learn to be a man and a man works for what he wants. He's not just expecting to be given. He actually yeah. works for it. So that's a good lesson. But don't forget, when the kid is five, the father might be, in this case, I don't know, 30, right? Mm -hmm. or, or 35. But then, you know, by the time he's 18 and he gives him that bitter lesson, there's bitterness behind it. Yeah. He says to him again, now you're a man. This world don't give a damn about you. So take all that you can. The father has already given up. He's older. He's yeah. already been through, you know, all of this process. And that's what he got out of it. Yeah. And even when he was younger, he says when he was about 13, his daddy told him, son, money is the means to all ends. Because at that age, the father already realized you got to make money to get by, to raise a family, to survive, you know, yeah. and life beats him down because this is the culture that we live in. So that's what I'm getting from it, you know, at this point. Because he begins to educate his child at five, to me, it means he wants his child to be ahead of the curve because the father may not know much up to that point where he's 30 something, but he knows enough to realize that you have to take initiative. So that's what he's trying to convey to his son. It's a very good lesson to teach your children. But like you said, as he grows older, as the son grows older, and as the father grows older, his take on the world may have been a lesson that he himself has yet to learn when Jimmy was five. So as he grows older, when Jimmy turns 18, he gives him that harsh lesson where what needs to drive him is the fear that the world won't care about him. This world don't give a damn about you, so take all that you can. 19, he turns a profit, stocks and shares, invest in product. 20, double down deposits. 21, his income rockets. 22, he learns the truth is just an obstacle to wealth. If you manipulate the data, then the lie will sell itself. 23, a life of luxury, crystal and cocaine. 24, he makes the Forbes list, they're applauding his name. 25, and his daddy tells him, listen here, son, while you're sitting in that palace, that don't mean that you won. 26, a business shift, he switches business to arms He's 27, dealing nuclear and shells in Iran 28, inside the Senate, money bought him a seat He's 29, a role of counsel in the president's suite Now he's 30, his daddy says you're losing the race You're just a servant to the king, not even in second place 31, a big manoeuvre for his daddy's approval Moving imports over borders from the exports out of Cuba 32, moving grams, growing kilos to tons He's 33 Filling warehouses with powder and guns 34, turf war with nobody to stop it Blind eye from the popo inside of his pocket Thirty-five, he gets the call. I'm sorry, son, but it's your father. Had a heart attack, I'm sorry, he's gone. Thirty-six, getting pissed off, abusing his product. Thirty-seven, eyes glazed, disposition demonic. Thirty-eight, with a prostitute, a moment of passion. Heating up a silver spoon and then chasing the dragon. Thirty-nine, getting breathless and hungry for power. Daddy's words are still driving him to kill and devour. Makes a move against the cartel, but the strategy's flawed. They retaliate and leave him in a hospital ward A bullet buried in his vertebra And one in his leg The doctor sighs and says I don't think you'll be walking again Fuck We talked before about the good intentions, and I said the father wanted the son to be ahead of the curve. That's why he started to teach him these things at a young age. And you said, depending on his personality, 
what started off as good intentions became an insatiable quest for power, where the end justified the means. He dabbles in illegal practices and probably gets a lot of people hurt because he's he's showing drugs and, and war with the cartel and probably causes a lot of bloodshed. He talks about when his father uh, dies, all that actually, it's not really to, to get that power, is to please his old man. And when he dies, then he gets uh, really derailed. He lost the sense of purpose. That's what caused him to go overboard and get into trouble with the wrong people. When he reaches that age, when his father dies, what you said is true. You, he kind of realized that he has no one left to seek the approval of. So he starts getting high on his own supply. And even within the drugs, the drugs get more and more severe. You know, it's drugs and alcohol, and, and then he's chasing the dragon, so it's yeah. like whatever, opium, heroin, he goes into the heavier stuff. Then he gets in trouble, wars with cartels, he gets shot, you know. Um, so this is like really going off the rails. But yeah, earlier he just shows that no matter how successful he was, none of it mattered. It wasn't about being successful. It wasn't about, you know, becoming the right-hand man of the president or whatever. That's You're still not the president, son. You know, that's kind of what his dad told him. So yeah. his dad is obviously also getting more and more bitter about, you know, his own life that he kind of passes it on to his son. Yeah, it's a conquest that leads to self-destruction. Let me tell you a story about a boy named Jimmy. He was 40 and he cursed the words, mine, mine, gimme. 41, he wasn't walking. 42, not walking quickly. 43, never running round the pavements of his city. 44, inside a palace with a mountain of gold. But those riches turn to rubble when perspective evolves. Weighing heavy on his conscience is the value of gold. Lamborghini for a life, trading money for souls. Jimmy followed the code inside the land of the free. Put your hand inside the cookie jar, take more than you need. And his example is exaggerated versions of me. And it's a version of him. And it's a version of she. And it's a version of you. There's no escape. Escaping the blame, the way we live is parasitic. Fuck the money and fame. Call the music. This isn't entertainment. This is real life. The way we live is lunacy. Community it declines. Hyperpolarized, always fighting, then we divide. Truth is less important than the money that we designed. Money's an invention. Politics from our invention. They all come from people's ideas. Did I mention? Borders an invention. Law and order fuel the tension. It leads to people killing each other. My solution? Everything is subject to change. We could build utopias if individuals were taught to use their brains. But if we teach kids in schools to always be sheep and put themselves before the herd, if there's more money for me, then there's no future I see where the humans survive with parasites inside a petri dish with cannibal minds. Mold will grow upon the surface and consumes till it dies. And our fate could be the same without this story to the wise. Forty-five, Jimmy comes home out of the rain, soaking wet upon a wheelchair, drinking again. He is everything he wants, he is fortune and fame. He's a fortunate fool with an unfortunate fate. With a 45 caliber aimed at his brain. 45 a fitting number, cause his age is the same. Here's the words of his father. It's such a damn shame. Then he presses on the trigger of a money game.
that was intense. It also ended kind of similar to the first one, kind yeah. of, although this could have different meanings, but yeah. There are similarities to Hiren as well. He, he breaks the fourth with wall. With the speech. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the speech. He actually breaks the fourth wall completely in the guise of still being in the act, but he's not, it's not the act. He's actually saying why Stop he made music. it. Yeah. Stop yeah. the music and actually say why he made it. He calls it a, a tale to the wise. He's like imploring people, listen to what I'm telling you. Many people have seen this cautionary tale. It's like saying, look at rich people, look at wealthy people. Are they happy? I especially liked a couple of things in that last bit at the end. You know, the one was the uh, 45 caliber aimed at his brain and 45 his was age. his age. At the end, he gets to the very last line of the song is something that he's already set up long, long, long before. And even when the line is, then he presses the trigger of a money game where he gave you an actual trigger. So the line that came in in part one, the same line was there, was actually foretelling, you know, the ending yeah. of this. Also, when he's sitting there in his wheelchair after, I think it was after the music stopped. I'm not sure. Uh, when he had the gun to his head and it started raining, I was just thinking, rain, rain, I had rain, that rain, whole, rain. Yeah, yeah, I had, I had the chorus I. in yeah. my head. And he yeah. didn't even sing it. And it no, was yeah. it was still there. So yeah. he has this genius way of implanting things in your head as well. Yeah. Which we've discussed before. And it, it this is just another example of that. Yeah. So I just love that. Yeah. There are a plethora of meanings to the same words and terms he uses. And they are contradictory to one another at times, or at least thought provoking. And here... He connects it to the first entry, Money Game Part 1. The rain falls on Jimmy, and, and the rain here is not money or anything. It's it's like a cleansing process. He, he is, uh, that's his realization of what life really means, of his errors, of the way he lived his life. When he's now, he has everything, and at the same time, he has nothing. So the rain drops on him, and he's actually, that's his clarity. The, the rain washes away all his misconceptions about life, just when he is at his lowest. Well, that's the thing. I think it also symbolizes that rock bottom type of situation as they do in a lot of movies. And as we said, he's very, very cinematic in a lot of uh, what he shows us here. I want to look at the trilogy, but I think we should probably look at this one first on its own. Mm -hmm. And I told you before that I had a bit of a hunch about something at the beginning. I'm not 100% sure that that hunch is right, but I have a feeling. I mean, this one ended, like I said, similarly to the first one where he's about to burn it all down, you know, light himself and the other one on fire. And we hear the lighter, but not the whoosh. So it's like, we don't know if he set himself on fire or not, mm -hmm. if this was something else. And here it's the same thing. You yeah. actually hear the click of like an empty chamber or a gun that gets stuck or something, but you don't hear a gunshot. Yeah. This is highly likely that it's symbolic and it means something. So... In the first and in the third, I don't think he actually kills off the character. I think it's supposed to be uh, symbolic. But at the very beginning, and uh, after uh, we talked about it, you referred to it as well. Um, the camera, after they show the piano, the camera kind of turns and does this like a spin. Yeah. What does that mean in cinematic language? It means you're not in reality. It's a dream. Yeah. It's, a, it's a dream state. It's a thought. It's a something. So I think this whole Jimmy story is that. I think he might be Jimmy, but a young Jimmy. And the young Jimmy has this dream where he sees where his life is going. Yeah, could be. So he tells you the story, and from a certain point, he tells you of things that have not yet happened. So him putting a gun to his head and the click is the wake up. Yeah, could be. That's what it felt like to me. And again, with the first one, that was probably a similar situation. He's telling us, the collective us, including himself, that lack of whoosh, that, that click of the, of the lighter was the wake up. Wake up before this happens. Wake up before, Jimmy, wake up before you put a bullet in your yeah. head. There's still hope. It's a cautionary tale. He's, yeah. he's, he's telling us something to create some sort of a change before it's too late in a way. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. It's quite beautiful. I think the whole motif with the lighter and the gun, there's something about that moment that is so magical with the way he presents it. He he doesn't give you the last frame you need to see in order to understand in which direction it went. It's like he's telling me as a viewer, if you've come to a moment where you are ready to throw in the towel and just uh, throw a monkey wrench 
punch on your whole life and end your life, then you better believe that if you have that kind of conviction, then you probably have the same conviction to turn your life around. In that moment where he pauses, he's actually saying it's a simple step to end your life, to pull that trigger, to light that lighter. So if you want to turn your life around and dig yourself out from rock bottom, then that means that you have to think in small steps back to the top. If you look at the structure of the trilogy, that almost explains everything. Because a lot of people, when they requested the trilogy, some sent us links and said, you know, do the um, the lyrics video. The, the second video is just a lyrics video. Da, 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 da. And I think some people online have sort of assumed that it's a lyrics video because of budgetary reasons. They didn't have time to shoot a video, so they did this. I don't think so. No, I think no, this yeah, yeah. Is planned. This yeah, is yeah. planned all along. Yeah. Um, because again, in the first one, it's a wake up call to the collective we saying, yeah. This is what's happening, guys. Take yeah. note. This is what's happening. You have to realize this. Yeah. So, in the first and in the third, that end click of a lighter of a gun or whatever it's that wake up call it's open your eyes it almost reminds me of the matrix where it's you know which pill do you want do you want to wake up or do you want to stay asleep yeah. in this state you yeah. know and the second one in the middle is to give you all the information you need and the background to understand what is yeah. going on educate yourself about the world about what is happening yeah. about the facts you know, yeah. and don't just assume because somebody tells you and, and all the rest of it, which will get you ready for that wake up yeah. where, you know, you might be able to create change, whether it's within yourself or within a, a larger community or anything like that. The characters with the head covered and everything, it's all us. We're the same person. None of it matters when he takes it off and it's Ren. He's telling you that. He said that line, I think it was in the first one. There's no left. There's no right. In the middle, we sleep. We sleep. We're sedated. Wake yeah. up. Yeah. We, we sleep. This is all a dream. All of it. I'm telling yeah. you something that can happen. So, yeah. you know, don't let this become reality. Wake up. We're asleep. Even now, like you look back, all the hints are there. It's like he leaves this breadcrumb trail for you to work it out. Even when you get to the third one, you can go backwards and kind of look at it again and, and find little things because your eyes have been opened. Yeah. Even in this format, it opens your eyes as you go along. If you watch the first one again, now you see more. And that's, I think, where his genius is. Yeah. Amazing. You said uh, the second one was intentional. It's not a budgetary issue. He's showing you things through the tube, through the television. And, and he shows you this is what the tube has been feeding you. He's showing you the fallacy in it. And in the third one, the whole thing around the breaking the fourth wall and pulling the trigger, he says any change that can come forth through the entirety of mankind has to start with the individual. It has to start with the person itself. So it's easy to destroy. You pull the trigger. It's, it's a step. It's a split second and then it's all over. But you use that small step in the other direction. It lets you decide and, and start rebuilding. There's an element in there of a rise and fall. Most people, they don't rise. They struggle all their lives and then they die. So they don't even have the perception of having it all and knowing that it wasn't worth it. Because most people don't get to those places where they're wealthy and have everything they need and, and no fear and all money is their God because of that because they don't have it. So once you do have it, then some people get into that realization with like Jimmy, that it wasn't worth it. What, what does it mean if we're all headed to the same place? No money in the world can save you from growing old and dying. So why? Why chase after that? A person has to hit rock bottom in order to realize those things. That's what it takes to wake up a person. But what he's also telling you is that rock bottom is not measured by what you have. You can have everything, everything, yeah. money, power, you know, all of that, and still hit rock bottom with yeah. all of that. This whole money game concept as well, he's saying, you know, we are people. You can be homeless with no money, with nothing, and complain about that and be unhappy about that. And you can have too much money and all this power and everything yeah. and not be happy with that either. Yeah. It's not money, is what he's saying. It's yeah. something else. And we yeah. can find it. We just need to actually open our eyes and start looking and change and understand that we are all the same, whether we are homeless, whether we are rich, whether we are the politicians and the criminals and the this, or we are just the public, we're all the same. Yet we kind of join in this money game for some reason where we are asleep. It's very, very matrix, actually, you know, when you think about it very much like the money game is, the, is you can say it's parallel, you know, kind of to the matrix in the way that, that people are affected and become a cog in the machine and, and yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah.
think there's a term in neuropsychology uh, called baseline dopamine. It means that dopamine levels rise when you have something that gives you joy, like a, a new car or a house or accumulating wealth. But it always balances out. It doesn't perpetually make you happy to accumulate wealth or, or material. Most people don't realize that. So they chase happiness with alcohol and drugs and accumulating more material. It never ends because true happiness doesn't come from that because of the balancing out of dopamine levels. It's even rooted in science. The only thing that can make a, a person truly happy is contribution, intrinsic value to the world. That's the purpose because people aren't a, a product. They are a process. We're all going to die. So the best things we can leave uh, at our wake is our actions, our doings, what we've built. I sit back and look at, you know, the three songs that we've covered. It's kind of amazing. It's almost like we watched a feature film in the way that you and I both love that has this thing with the breadcrumbs that takes you to an ending that um, sometimes it's not even a, uh, a twist ending, but it's some kind of an understanding, you know, and you kind of start going backwards and, it, and, and you go through the story and work out what happened, how we got there and what it all means and how it kind of opens your eyes. And the way he tells this has that effect of exactly what he's telling, you know, that opening your eyes at the end going, oh, yeah. everything, this, this and that meant this, this was a, a clue, this, you know, all the steps along the way is yeah. to kind of open your eyes to the meanings. But the meaning is about opening your eyes within itself, you know, it's like yeah. saying, wake up, open your eyes, understand what you're doing to yourself. Even the imagery, you know, all this stuff where burning it all down or shooting or whatever, that's killing yourself. Yeah. And he's almost telling us with this final cautionary tale, especially, you know, do you just want to give up and kill yourself? Or do you want to open your eyes and kill your old self and become this new, you know, being that can see through the world pulled over our eyes, like those masks and everything, those yeah. covers that uh, that go through the story. It's just, he goes from collective in the first one to global in the second. You know, that tube actually represents yeah. not just TV, it's like social media, it's, you yeah. know, it's everything. Everybody else. Yeah. And then it goes to personal. So collective, global, personal, that kind of thing. And in these three stories, he had to save the personal to the end because he wants to hit us, you know, in here and in here. Yeah. And not just about everybody else. This is about us. Yeah. This is about we, you know, and not pointing the finger, not saying, look at other people, look at this, look at yourself and work it out because yeah. we have to work it out. Otherwise, we are killing each other and ourselves. Because we need to see the first two to really understand what it means that change comes from the self. He sets it up. Yeah. And you said something about the, the filmmaking aspect. There's a cartoonish scenario in my head. I don't know why I thought about it. I, I used to think about it back in the 90s when I was a teenager, when a, every time a, a film director that we both love came out with a new film. I had it in my mind that if Ren directs a feature film, you'd see probably, you won't see it today because everything is online. You'd see probably a, a swarm of people rushing to the box office headed by me with a bunch of cash in my hand to buy a ticket to see his movie. You know, yeah. I mean, here, take my money. Yeah, yeah, take my money. <laughs> Let me see. I think we should start a petition. Ren should make a feature film. I'd watch that. I think, you know, he's a, he's a musician. He's a storyteller. Storytellers, as you know, can go in many, many different directions. Um, you know, filmmakers, uh, authors. Uh, musicians. So it doesn't really matter to me if he goes into filmmaking or not. If he ends up making a film, who knows what it's going to turn out like, because he's got to go where his passion is. And it's yeah, obviously yeah. music. And he's making these short films within that, yeah. which, like you say, might hint that he does have that kind of passion towards filmmaking as well, maybe, which yeah. is interesting. You know, he might actually go there at some stage. I'm happy with what he's doing right now, because again, every time we cover one of his songs, it opens our eyes to something new or in a different way. And it's just, it's exhilarating as it is depressing, you know, yeah. because a lot of it is about the reality of the world around us, which is not at all positive. Very, very, very cool. What you said about it being exhilarating and at the same time depressing, I like to think about it as bittersweet contemplation between what is, what he's showing, and what could be if we change the way we look at things. To me, it's the best way to uh, look at it because there's still hope. You can still change as long as you get enough people opening their minds. If you, if you believe you can destroy, you better believe you can fix. We've done the Money Game trilogy and, you know, after we're done and we release the episodes and everything, we'll probably go back and watch them again. And I'm sure we're going to find a shit ton of stuff that we missed. Um, yeah. Because first viewing, there's just too much. Um, a, lo a lot of um, text and a lot of visuals. And you try to kind of get everything at the same time. 
and yeah it's uh it's like uh it's a roller coaster ride we've yeah. said this before he yeah. is an absolute master to, uh, storyteller and uh yeah i have a like a huge appreciation for his work I, i'm so far loving it it's it's not even like easy to put into words how much yeah uh the notion came to my head if you play uh ren's music in your car or play it and, and do something else then you're hearing ren but if you look mm -hmm. at his music videos you're actually listening to ren it's a different experience altogether because when we reacted to money game part two i said the music is just a part of what he shows you there's a lot in it that has nothing to do with the music that he shows you as a storyteller that's magical to me it's a true artist the true versatile artist yeah i think anyone who just listens to ren's music without watching it without seeing the complete product then they're missing out on i'd say almost half of it really yeah. after you see it and obviously hear it and see it together the music videos and everything you can go and listen to it because it'll prompt all of these things again yeah. but if you've never seen the video and you just listen to the music you're missing out on too much once again thank you robert m for uh sending us this request uh for the halt of the trilogy because it's been an amazing ride we've loved it every step of the way and uh yeah we're looking forward to more rent requests so thanks again yeah, thank you, Robert, for requesting this trilogy. We had a lot of fun reacting to it. And I think we're still reacting to it in our heads, even if it's not going to be in the episode. So thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, guys, please be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and click the little bell icon so you'll get notified on all our future videos. If you have a request you'd like bumped up the line, please make it through Buy Me A Coffee. All contributions are, of course, very much appreciated. Thank you all for sticking with us. Thank you all for your time. I know we've agreed not to talk about how old band members look, but they look like kids. They look like teenagers. They produce such amazing sounds. It's something that we've seen from Japanese bands. This is yet another amazing uh, entry. It's pretty safe to say that they're young. Thanks again, guys. We appreciate you more than you know. Without you, there would be no show. We'll be back in a couple of days with a new episode, and we hope to see you then. Bye for now. Bye, guys.